It's always, um, it's always nice to be the person who comes on after everyone's had coffee, so everyone's awake. And um, I think we have a choice now. Either I can spend 20 minutes talking about whether Britain should come out of Europe or not, or, or I can talk about branded content. And maybe today I won't talk about uh, Europe, but just so you know, I vote for us to stay in. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, so as you've already heard, my name is Steve Ackerman and I'm the uh, managing director and co-owner of Something Else and we're one of uh, the UK's largest content agencies and we make uh, content across the board, so TV, video, radio, audio, social media and interactive content for brands and broadcasters and uh, in fact, uh, Javier, one of the organisers, he, uh, he, he very kindly took, took me out for dinner last night, I had a very nice Madrid meal. And uh, he said, um, I, I, I said to him how long I've, I've been uh, creating content for brands for, which is uh, about 20 years. And he said, well, you, you should mention that because um, that, that's a long time. People won't believe you. And I said, well, they will believe me because you can just see the grey hairs on my chin. Uh, for those in the front row, you can see the grey hairs. My, at the back, you can't see the grey hairs. Uh, but uh, I've been doing it for, um, for a long time. And... Um, Today I'm going to talk uh, to you about uh, a branded content project from last year uh, that's a great example of using innovation to excite audiences and create great content and ultimately to sell product, which obviously is what branded content uh, is about. It's, uh, it's called Silver Point. It was a project for Absolute Vodka uh, in the UK. I'll explain the project to you and then I'll explain what I think it tells us about branded content. But before I get to that, I just wanted to explain three insights about us that I think will help you to understand how we did what we did and why we did what we did. So, the first insight about us is uh, the phrase an audience business. Um, we, we are a content agency, but we like to describe ourselves as an audience business. Why? Because everything, we believe everything we do is about maintaining, retaining, and building audiences for the people that we work for. And I use the word audiences very intentionally as opposed to consumers. Now, it's, it's our belief that if you think about people as consumers, then you're trying to sell something to them. If you think about them as audiences, then you're trying to entertain them or educate them or inform them. And, and obviously, this is, uh, this is at the heart of what content is. And um, even though content is marketing, it's not the same as traditional advertising. I know everyone here knows that. Uh, and the same rules don't apply to it. So the idea of thinking about audiences and not consumers is a journey that we actually still find many clients have, have to go on. I'm sure everyone uh, here who, who, who works in content has had that experience where the client says to you, it's a brilliant idea, but, but can you get my product in the film or in the, in, you know, can you show the car? And it's like, well, that, that's not what content's about. So thinking about audiences is, is the first point. The second thing for us that's, that's very important is that our journey has been to go from broadcasters to brands. So the background of our company is that we've been making radio and TV uh, for the BBC and for Sky and for the other big broadcasters for over 20 years. And that's relevant because obviously it's that experience that brands now want in terms of reaching audiences with compelling content. And um, after all, you know, in terms of creating great content, this is what broadcasters do every day of the week. They're fantastic at it. They've been doing it for many, many years. And it's, it's that that brands and marketeers are now trying to harness. So some of our retained clients include people like Top Man and Swarovski and The Economist and Penguin Random House. And it's that experience of creating content for the world's biggest broadcasters that, that has meant brands have come to us uh, so that they can connect with us. And it's that thinking about audiences, not consumers, that has ensured we're constantly trying to come up with compelling ideas. So the third and final point about our approach is something we like to call super-serving. Now, what, are, what does that mean? Super-serving audiences, we, uh, we uh, talk about a lot. We believe that if the audience wins, the brand wins. It's an approach uh, that we framed in this word super-serving, but if the audience wins, the brand wins. And that means creating content that's so strong that the audiences choose to engage with it. They choose to, uh, to listen or to watch or to play with the content that's being created. Now, obviously, that's a big difference from traditional advertising that actually, if you think really about advertising, it aims to get in the way of the thing you're trying to consume. It's trying to get in the way. And what we're trying to do is not be in the way we want audiences to, to choose us. And we believe that if the content is strong enough, then it will raise awareness or loyalty 
or purchase, or maybe all three for the brand, depending, of course, on what the strategy of the campaign is. And you'll see that this idea of super serving, this idea of making something so strong that audiences have to choose it, uh, runs through the work I'm going to show you now in terms of Silverpoint. So, uh, what was Silverpoint? Uh, well, let's start at the beginning. Um, Absolute Vodka were launching a a special edition of their bottle. Um, they constantly, throughout the year, they bring out different versions of, of the bottle, and they were bringing out an Andy Warhol edition. They have, uh, certainly in the UK, Absolute Vodka have a history of associating with art and artists, and they wanted to revisit this, this, this history. Um, and the reason they wanted to do this was to help re-establish themselves as a, as a cool, cool vodka brand. Uh, they wanted to target very cool Londoners who are tastemakers, people whose opinions count with their friends and with their peer groups and who can obviously influence purchase. Now, Absolute's marketing budgets are a lot smaller than their rivals, and especially Smirnoff, which is obviously a very, very large vodka brand. Uh, Absolute have smaller budgets to play with, so they needed to do something that would really make a great impression on this, on this group. And I think uh, uh, that budget is really crucial uh, to their approach, because, because it gave them an appetite for risk that I don't think they would have necessarily had if they'd have had a larger amount of money uh, to, to play with. So their brief to us was, help them make Absolute famous amongst this tastemaker group. Now, they put us together with a, a theatre company called Punch Drunk. Um, Punch Drunk aren't any ordinary theatre company. In fact, Punch Drunk do not do theatre in places like this, in theatres. Uh, Punch Drunk create experiences where... Uh, where the actors are amongst you and where you're not sure who's an actor and who's a real person. They create really fantastic shows. And I, if you've been to New York and seen a show there that's been running for a number of years now called Sleep No More, that is uh, Punch Drunk. So they're, they're an incredible group of creatives. They really understand storytelling, but I think what's really interesting is they understand how to take audiences out of their comfort zone. So with them, we came up with the concept of creating a game that would take over your life and start to merge gameplay, so play on your tablet or on your phone, with the real world. A game where you really couldn't be quite sure what was real life and what was the game, and a game that merges the digital world and the real world. So how did it work? Um, so Silverpoint is actually the style of a bunch of drawings that Andy Warhol did. Actually, let me just um, go back to this previous, uh, previous slide. Um, because I'll show you... Yeah, so this, so this hand is, uh, is an Andy Warhol drawing. And this style of drawing is, is called Silverpoint. And um, um, so the game used a whole bunch of drawings that Andy Warhol had done. And they were used as the sort of style guide for the game. Um, and the game is actually uh, about, um, about a, a girl called Chloe. And uh, you can't quite read that, but it says something like, uh, Chloe lived at home with her, with her mother. Um, and um, uh, the game's about this girl called Chloe, and she gets addicted to playing a game, and she's gone missing. That's basically the story of the game. Now, as I, as I explain how it all worked, I think you'll understand uh, a little bit more uh, about it. So the game starts with a, a, a very simple uh, match-three game, where you just have to match up the different planets uh, on your phone. It's a very typical mobile phone game. If you go on the London Underground every day of the week, you see everybody playing their games to, to, uh, to uh, kill, kill the journey time. And so it's a very simple game, but very addictive. And as you play, you get points. And as you get points, you start to unlock bits of the story about Chloe. So as you play, uh, bits of the story come up. And I'm sorry, you can't quite read what that says, but, but little bits of, of narrative like this, cards that tell you a little bit about the story, um, come up, and again, this is the card, I think, that says Chloe lived at home with her mother. So as you play, you learn a little bit more about Chloe all the time. And um, then, as you continue to play, uh, we start to ask you for personal details, like your phone number and your name, and this is where it starts to get interesting. So this, this is actually asking, I think, for, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for you to, to input your name. And once we could find out personal details about you, um, then we could start to do some very interesting things because we had a team of social media producers who could look online and track you down and find out what you were doing. Look at your Twitter feed, look at your Facebook page, look at you on LinkedIn. And uh, obviously, in, in, 
in these days, it's very easy to find out a lot of information very quickly uh, about players. So once we knew your name, we could really start to find out things about you, what you were passionate about, how you spent your time, and then we could start to, uh, to send personal messages to you. So, uh, so this message says something like, uh, I think it says, says something like, um, hello, Michelle, um, what, why are you going to the party on Saturday? Why don't you play me? Now, you can imagine, as a player, when your phone suddenly says this message to you, this is a, this is a bit of a shock, because we're not used to, we're not used to our, phone, our phone being something so personal back to us without us telling it uh, what to do. And there were all sorts of messages we were able to send, you know, uh, don't take the kids to the football, stay at home and play me. Um, ignore the wife, we know she's getting on your nerves, play me. All, all these messages. And lots and lots of messages, a big social media team that were sending out these messages all the time to the players. And to be honest, you only have to send one or two of these messages to a player for it to have the impact. So it's not like we had to send 10, 20, 30 messages. One or two messages to each player, very personal messages, that would really sort of uh, freak, freak them out a little bit um, and um, get them excited. Uh, and then as you advance in the game, things get even more creepy because you learn that Chloe was invited. She, she got addicted to this game. Mm, you're getting addicted to a game. Uh, and then you learn that she was invited to go to an event, which is what this uh, slide is. It, it, it's an invitation uh, to an event. And sure enough, as you carry on playing, you get an invite on your phone to come to an event at a bar. So it seems like your world and Chloe's world are starting to, to sort of merge and come together. Um, and this is the invitation, the sort of invitation you would get. And if you scrolled down, there were, there were 20, 30 different bars in London that you could go to, and you just selected which one you were going to, um, you were going to attend. Uh, and then, of course, because we've got your phone number, we can then continue to send you personal messages. Uh, so we could send you text messages on your phone, SMSs. Uh, so things like... Um, are you coming? Are you coming tonight? I need to see you. So you'd be at work and you just get this message, are you coming tonight? I need to see you. And then once you get to the bar, this is where the bit from Punch Drunk begins, because you get to the bar and then real people, actors, start to interact with you to carry on the story of Chloe. So it's a pretty freaky experience because you don't know who in the bar is normal, who's playing the game, and, you don't, uh, and, and who's an actor, who, who, who's there to add to the story for you. So people are coming up and doing strange things and telling you bits of information, and, and it's a very strange experience. And then along with that, we also used uh, eye beacons. So we could send messages as you came to the bar, we could send messages again to your phone because you're, in, you're within close proximity of the bar. So we could send messages like, I knew you'd come. Wow, okay, this is freaky. Um, and... Uh, throughout the evening, we could then add more clues to what happened to Chloe and the story bef uh, behind her. And of course, importantly for Absolute, this is, a, this is a voucher. So once you're in the bar, we can send a voucher to your phone, and you can then go up to the bar and have a free drink and sample Absolute Vodka as well. Now, in fact, uh, for many of our, of our sort of uber players, the players who played a lot, they didn't just come out of their house once. They came out of their house three times to go to different things happening around London, which when you think a uh, piece of content is causing them to, to do that, they're so heavily engaged that they've left their home three times. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's quite impressive. And in fact, uh, one of the visits, they actually went to a hairdresser's where they sat in a chair... Uh, the woman at the hairdressers didn't say anything to them. She cut some of their hair off, and then they were told to leave again. So it's like, really, what's going on? It's all very, very strange. And the game finishes by inviting you to a meeting point in the middle of London, and you're just standing in a square, and a stranger comes up to you and just puts a phone number into your hand. You call the number, and then messages on the phone tell you where to go, and you end up going to an underground bunker, and people put hoods on your face, and eventually you find out what happened to Chloe. I'm not going to tell you what happens to Chloe, but, um, but, but you find out the, um, you know, the end of the story. Now, as you can imagine, for a game that starts on the phone and ends like that, that's a pretty amazing and unusual experience. And for the ultimate players, uh, they, um, they actually got a bottle of absolute vodka sent to their house as well. So... Uh, uh, Nicole Shapiro here says, what a lovely, colourful surprise on a dull Tuesday afternoon. Thank you, Absolute, for my silver point bottle. Um, so in terms of results, now remember, we were targeting 
very, very hard to reach Londoners, really cool Londoners. So this isn't about big numbers, this is about the influence those numbers can exert. 20,000 Londoners downloaded the game, which is, which is what Absolute uh, were, were, were aiming for. But interestingly, that immediately put it into Apple's top 10 for adventure games. So obviously for a brand, again, that's really priceless that their branding is in the App Store. 13 of those, 13,000 of those 20,000 played the game for five hours or more. Now, if you know anything about gaming, that's a very long time. That truly means people are very engaged and are, are, are really playing very heavily. Two and a half thousand of those people came out of their homes to the events to find out what had happened eventually. And, and you only got the invite to the events if you played long enough and you were really engaged in the game enough. And those two and a half thousand people sampled 5,000 Absolute cocktails, which, by the way, is the maximum number that Absolute could accommodate. So they actually they didn't expect to get as many people as this coming, coming out uh, to the bars. Now, we, we obviously measured and surveyed players after the campaign, and this is obviously, the, uh, I suppose, the, the really important bit, because 60% of people said they'd recommend Absolute to a friend. So 60% of the people who played said they'd recommend Absolute to a friend. And after this activity, Absolute became the number one brand for pubs and bars uh, to, to buy. The bottle itself, which you can just see there, sold out within six weeks when Absolute had planned that it would be three months. That's normally how long it takes them to sell, sell their special uh, edition bottles. So, it sold out in six weeks. So, you'll remember at the start I talked about audiences and not consumers and uh, creating a mindset that seeks to entertain and engage people whilst achieving objectives for the brand. Well, um, Absolute uh, achieved this, and, and hopefully you can read some of these, but um, uh, you know, tweets like uh, from this lady at the top, Joanne, a haunting, invigorating, amazing finale, shaken, stirred. Uh, Absolute UK, I wanted the evening to last almost forever. Um, uh, the next one down, Absolute UK, Silver Point done, absolutely thrilling, brilliant finale. Now you can imagine, obviously for a brand, that is really, really priceless. Um, you know, if you have audiences who are, who are evangelizing about you, that's something really exciting for a brand. And remember, we were aiming to make the brand famous amongst a really hard to reach uh, group of young Londoners who are super cool. So the fact that they were evangelizing about Absolute like that, is really important. And of course, however much they're tweeting and sending messages on social media, you can be sure that for every tweet, there'd be 20 friends they would have told about the experience and would have told about the brand uh, itself. And that's, that was the exact aim of the campaign, of course. So you remember, uh, um, uh, I said at the start about when the audience wins, the brand wins. Well, I, I believe Silverpoint is the evidence of this, of when the audience wins, the brand wins. When the content you give the audience is so good that they'll talk about it, they'll love it, and ultimately they'll buy it if that is the aim of the campaign, which it was here. I think um, if you think about your favorite TV shows, you know, Game of Thrones uh, or Breaking Bad, uh, or for me, the, the Wire, which is the greatest television ever made. Um, if you're a fan, you talk about it nonstop. My wife gets really fed up with me talking about The Wire. Uh, because I love it, and I want to. Every time I meet someone who hasn't, in fact, last night I talked with Javier. I said, "Have you seen The Wire?" He said, "No." I said, "You've got to watch it. It's the greatest TV ever made." I tell everybody about The Wire, and this is this was the same impact here. People who played were telling all their friends about Absolute. And I think if you make great content, we actually use content in a way to define ourselves. It defines our personality and, and who, who we are. It's a sign of recommendation. So really, I think actually this project is not about tech uh, or even innovation. I think it's about the fact that we understood this audience and what would excite them. Now, that's the same skills that allow us to make great TV and radio shows for the BBC. The skills that we do for them are the same skills that allowed us to make great, compelling content for this audience. For very cool Londoners, it was something they'd never experienced. A game that merges the real world and the digital world where no one's quite sure what's real or not. A game where the phone starts to speak back to you and seems to know what you're doing in everyday life. A game where you're not quite sure of the people around you, who is real, who is an actor, who's in, in the game, who's not in, in on the game. We understood that the way to make Absolute famous was create a content experience that could even impress people who are really used to accessing the best content all the time. So I just want to finish with five sort of wider content lessons I think you can draw from this, from this project. The first one is be as best as the best. So whether you're a brand uh, who are making video, podcasts, social media, content, or games, 
I think the same rules apply. The audience don't care who's paying for it. The audience don't care who's paying for it. What they care about is, is it good? Will it entertain them? Will it get them talking? Will it do something for them? And in this case, was it strong enough to give them an experience like they'd never had before? Now that means that whatever you're making for marketing purposes has to be as good as the stuff made by the best content people in the world. Netflix, the BBC, EA Games, the Serial Podcast. These are the people who've been making great content for decades and decades. These are the people who understand how to engage audiences. And so I think they're the benchmark for standout content. And in fact, I actually think we shouldn't really talk about our work as branded content because in a way, it sort of demeans us. You know, you don't hear TV producers talking about broadcaster content. They just talk about content. And if we're going to make stuff as good as the broadcasters, we should just be talking about content. We shouldn't be saying it's branded content. It doesn't matter. It's just good content. This is what I think the audiences compare us to when they're consuming branded content. And that means this is the level that brands have to reach. And of course, 30-second adverts compete against other adverts in the TV break for attention. But content competes against everything that is out there. So that means it's got to grab the audience's attention, and I think that's a key learning from this project. It's asking the audience to make a choice to, in this case, play the game, but obviously it may be to watch a video or consume some really good social media or some of the other projects that we've seen today. With, with great content, we're asking the audience to make a choice to actively consume. And uh, unlike traditional ad adverts, which, is, which are just there, and as I said earlier, actually in the way of the video, radio show, or newspaper article that the audience are trying to enjoy. So my second point is, this is not advertising. I hope that doesn't upset anyone. Uh, don't let, if you're a client here today, don't let your agency tell you they know how to make great content just because they make beautiful advertising. And don't be an ad agency who pretends you know this space if you don't. The art of telling a story in 30 seconds or with a, uh, a beautiful image is very, very different in, uh, compared to doing it across a game or a series of online videos. So content is marketing, but I don't believe it's advertising in its traditional sense, though it obviously has similar objectives. It requires different storytelling skills, different production processes, and definitely a different sign-off process than I think the client is normally used to. The third point is reward the audience. Brands that understand their audience and, and, and give them content of value, give the audience something, will be rewarded back. Now, we've seen this obviously with some of the famous cases like Red Bull and Apple and um, maybe people like MasterCard. And in this case, obviously, absolute. And it's something as, a, as an agency we see over and over again. Reward the audience. Now, this project produced a sense of love and evangelism from the people who played it. They tweeted their thanks to Absolute. They told Absolute how brilliant they were. They talked about it. They told their friends about Absolute. They told their friends to go and buy the game, download the game, buy the bottle, come in a bar, choose Absolute. Um, they really, really loved it. Um, content gives an incredible opportunity for brands to create a strong bond between the brand and the audience in a way that I think is very rarely achieved by tr a traditional advertising campaign. And it's not too strong to say that the people who played Silverpoint couldn't stop talking about it. For a brand, that sense of warmth and love is priceless. I think it's the stuff that clients really, really dream of. Fourth, I know it's said a lot, Creativity is about risk-taking, and we've all heard this lots, and we hear creatives say it all the time, and clients say, oh yeah, you know, I want to take risks, but I think here is true evidence of risk-taking. It's impossible to be truly creative without taking some risks, and Absolute were willing to, to, to do that, that idea of merging a game with the real world, that's proper risk-taking. Risk they were... They were, they were willing to gamble their entire marketing budget. They weren't doing any other activity in this period. So they were willing to spend all their money on, on a project where we couldn't guarantee to them that there would be results. There were no numbers, there were no media plans that could give them the comfort. And I think that was quite important. TV spots and banner ads and radio ads, they're guaranteed eyes and ears, obviously because of their intrusiveness and the media plans behind them, but content has to work harder to get the audience's attention. So creativity becomes a more important way of standing out. I'm on my last point now. No problem. So finally, finally, <laughs> entertain, educate, and inform. Now, the BBC's mission statement is this. The BBC say this, entertain... Ent uh, entertain, educate, and inform. And I think that's a great message for producers of branded content, and this is what makes it different from traditional advertising. At its best, branded content will do one of these things. Entertain, educate, 
or inform whilst also representing the brand. So, content competes against everything. That means don't treat it as advertising. Reward the audience, take creative risks, and aim to entertain. So finally, double finally, <laughs> I'm moving over here in case he comes and grabs me. Um, what's the lesson for us all? So I, I believe it's this. In a world where broadcasters want to behave like brands and brands want to be broadcasters, there's an opportunity like never before for brands to create a new, re uh, a new relationship with their audience. There's an opportunity for brands who very often have budgets far in excess of many broadcasters to place themselves at the heart of the relationship with the audience that in the past only a few brands have done, like Apple or Red Bull. For this to happen, many clients and their agencies need a complete change of mindset, or maybe a change of agency. But the opportunity is there, and Silverpoint is a great example of when it works, it works well. So thank you, good luck with your projects, and remember, great content. If you make great content, not only does the audience win, the brand wins as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry.